does the Vatican have their sights on the fraternity of St. Peter? It's been quite the year, hasn't it? This summer we had Traditiones Custodes, which put all kinds of regulations on the traditional Latin Mass. It also moved the Ecclesia Dei bodies, such as Fraternity of St. Peter, Institute of Christ the King, under the regulation of the Congregation for Doctrine uh, for Divine Worship and under the regular uh, Congregation for um, Instituted Life and Religious Life. And just this past week, we had the December 18th document, which brought even more regulations on the traditional Latin Mass, and not just the traditional Latin Mass, the other six sacraments, and as we'll see today, even on things like exorcism and the rituale. So, the topic today is, does this recent regulation, and does Traditiones Custodes, both documents, do they apply the Fraternity of St. Peter, and I guess we could say by extension, to the Institute of Christ the King, or do they not? I'm gonna to argue today that they do. And I'm also going to comment on the response of the Fraternity of St. Peter. And I want to assure you that I am a grateful parishioner of a Fraternity of St. Peter Parish that we have been attending now for, I get the dates confused, but I think we're at 11 years at a parish of the Fraternity of St. Peter. Priests of the Fraternity of St. Peter have given the sacrament of baptism thrice to our family, First Communions four times, five times, five First Communions, Sacrament of Confirmation three times, and we have benefited greatly through the sacerdotal ministry of the priests of the Fraternity of St. Peter. So I have great love and a historic appreciation for the work they do. Now, for those of you that are probably new to a tra the traditional movement, the Fraternity of St. Peter was founded in 1988 by Catholic priests who left the Society of St. Pius X, which was founded by Archbishop Lefebvre. And you can see him right there in the bottom left corner in the black and white. That's Archbishop Lefebvre, a younger Lefebvre with his, with his beard. They broke in 1988 over the question of Archbishop Lefebvre consecrating not one, but four bishops in 1988, and Archbishop Lefebvre felt that he was under an extreme situation, a situation of duress in which the traditional Catholic priesthood, this traditional seminary formation, the traditional ordination rite, and the traditional priesthood expressed was going to be lost, and the only way you could preserve it is by bishops being willing to do the traditional formation the traditional ordination and the traditional preservation of the Catholic priesthood. And so he moved forward with the consecration of four bishops in 1988. There were people, priests in the Society of St. Pius X that thought, this is a bridge too far. Uh, this is disobeying John Paul II. It is not working with Cardinal Ratzinger who was assigned to this project and the whole thing blew up. And these priests met with Cardinal Ratzinger and they were allowed to form a new society, a priestly society that they named after St. Peter. And this all began in 1988. And at this point in the traditional history is where we have our first Y in the road, a fork in the road. You have the original movement that started with Archbishop Lefebvre in the year 1970. That's the year the Novus Ordo uh, went into effect. And then in 1988, you see the Society of St. Pius X actually have this split. There's no audio. Oh, I see why there's no audio. My mic was over there. Mea maxima culpa. Does that fix it? I think it fixed it. There we go. It fixed it. So, with this split, there's been some division in the traditional camp over what is the proper response. Are we in an extreme 
situation like the church was in the 300s where Athanasius and other bishops, stalwart defenders of the divinity of Christ would do things that um, were against certain local synods, where they would enter into other dioceses to consecrate, to ordain, to give confirmation. Um, during that time, of course, we had a pope in exile, all kinds of things that were going on. It's an extreme situation. And so priests, bishops can operate in a time of duress without any fault. Or, that's the argument of the Society of St. Pius X and of Archbishop Lefebvre. Or, is the situation not so extreme that we should always defer to Rome even when the decisions are hostile or contrary to tradition, to orthodoxy, to Catholic morality, etc.? It's really a question of how extreme is our current situation. And I think since, at least in America, since the Cardinal McCarrick situation, well, let me back up, since Pope Francis, and then with Cardinal McCarrick, and then with the financial scandals and the sexual scandals, and this constant hammering on traditional Catholics, more and more people are saying, we're in an extreme situation. We need to recognize the papacy, the cardinals, Rome, but we need to resist at the same time because this is dangerous to the faith. People are asking, was Archbishop Lefebvre right? Or was the fraternity of St. Peter Right, and following Lefebvre, but then also saying, well, we can't actually consecrate bishops without papal mandate. That's a bridge too far. So today we're going to cover the response of the Fraternity of St. Peter, whether these new regulations do apply to the Fraternity of St. Peter. And at the end, I'm going to give some analysis and some thoughts on it. Again, I'm just a Catholic layman. My opinion is simply my opinion. But before we start, we will pray the Our Father. Oremos in nomine Patris et Fidei et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Pater Noster, qui es in Celi, sanctificetur nomen tuum, advenia regnum tuum, fiat voluntas tua, sicut in cello et in terra. Panem nostrum quotidianum da nobis odie, et dimite nobis debita nostra, sicut et nos dimitimus debitoribus nostris, et ne nos inducas in tentationem, se libera nos amalo. Amen. Nomini Patris, et Vidii, et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Before we get started, there's a little humor. I loved this tweet by Father Gregory Elder, and he writes right here on the screen, The Pope has directed that henceforth the Tridentine Mass cannot be advertised, so at my parish we shall no longer announce the 2.30 Latin Mass. Henceforth, sometime after 2.29, but not later than 2.31, there will be a cultural gathering for immigrants from the Roman Empire, end quote. It's tricky. It's tricky. I like it. It's humorous. And there's been some other fun things that have been appearing online. And what this shows, by the way, is I think it does reveal, whether anyone will admit it or not, a sympathy for Archbishop Lefebvre. In other words... We all know that we have to be subject to the Roman pontiff and the Roman see. We have to obey the Holy Father. But we also realize that when it comes to things that are contrary to natural law or divine law or the common good, remember Thomas Aquinas talks about the four causes of a, of a true law. When those things are lacking from the Holy Father, should we obey them? Or should we have a sometime after 229, but... Before 231, there'll be a cultural gathering for immigrants of the Roman Empire. All right, here's the statement from the Fraternity of St. Peter. And let me see if I can put it up on the screen for you here. By the way, I asked in the poll before the show started, does the recent document from the Vatican reveal an agenda against the FSSP or not? And 90% of you said 
it does. And I agree with you. I think they're definitely uh, being uh, being focused on here in this regulation. Okay, here's the statement from the Fraternity of St. Peter. The recent document from the Congregation for Divine Worship released on December 18th does not directly address the former Ecclesia Dei community, such as the Priestly Fraternity of St. Peter, who possess their own proper law. The members of the Fraternity of St. Peter promise to be faithful to our constitutions at the time of our admittance into the fraternity, and we remain committed to exactly that, fidelity to the successor of Peter and faithful observance of the liturgical and disciplinary traditions of the Church in accordance with the provisions of the Moto Proprio Ecclesia Dei of July 2, 1988, which is the origin of our foundation. The superiors of the priestly fraternity will be studying the document more closely while maintaining our ministry to the faithful entrusted to our care, end quote. So first off here, they're actually making a Lefebvreite argument here. Remember, Archbishop Lefebvre said, hey, I am only doing what I was ordained as a priest to do, which is the traditional Latin Mass, the traditional sacraments, traditional preaching, traditional theology. All I'm doing is what I was originally tasked to do by Mother Church, even when I was made a bishop. So it's an, it's an appeal to the past saying, we are going to continue to do exactly what we were tasked to do, which is the traditional Catholic faith. And the Fraternity of St. Peter here is making the same exact argument, except instead of going back further in time, they're going back to 1988. And I, would, I think it's better to not just stop in 88, but let's just keep, going, keep on rolling backwards in the time here. They're saying, look, we were set up to distribute the sacraments in accordance with tradition and to maintain the traditional Catholic faith, and we're just going to keep on keeping on. But that's the same argument as Lefebvre. Again, just different dates chosen here. The other thing is it says that this document on December 18th does not directly address the former Ecclesia Dei communities, such as the priestly fraternity of St. Peter, who possess their own proper law. That's the first part. Now, I'm not so... This is either a flex, and if it is, I greatly admire the flex. FSSP, good job. It's either a flex or it's a sidestep. And I hope it's the former. I hope this is a flex. They're basically saying... <laughs> Bounces off me, sticks on you. Does not apply here. If it's a sidestep, they're just buying time. And my worry is, is although the document on December 18th does not say the words priestly fraternity of St. Peter, it does state itself as being a clarification of Traditionis Custodes, which does name the Ecclesia Dei communities. So it's a clarification of a document that does speak to the fraternity of St. Peter. Secondly, the December 18th document has regulations for personal parishes, and the fraternity of St. Peter has personal parishes. So it does apply to those situations. And sadly, as a father, looking forward to two of my children receiving the sacrament of confirmation coming up, there's big questions here on whether the sacrament of confirmation can still be conferred in personal parishes. Here is what the December 18th document says. Twice it refers to personal parishes. The original dubia, the original question, sent to the Congregation for Divine Worship, says, Is it possible, according to the provisions of the Motu Propria Traditionis Custodis, to celebrate the sacraments with the Rituale Romanum and the Pontificale Romanum, which predate the liturgical form of the Second Vatican Council? Question mark. Answer, negative. No, you can't. This is just mind-blowing. Here's the answer. The diocesan bishop is authorized to grant permission to use only the Rituale Romanum, last Editio Typica, 1952, and not the Pontificale Romanum, which predate the liturgical form of the Second Vatican Council. He may grant this permission only to those canonically erected personal parishes, 
Fraternity of St. Peter, which according to the provisions of the Moto Proprio Traditionis Custodis, celebrate using the Missale Romano of 1962. So here they're saying you can use the Rituale, but you cannot use the Pontificale. Now, the Rituale has, uh, I'm looking at it right here on the screen, it has uh, the, the ritual for baptism, the ritual for confirmation, extreme unction, blessings, exorcisms, etc. The When bishops celebrate sacraments, notably the Mass, they pontificate. They use a different, another book, the Pontificale, which has the special, for example, a pontifical high mass uh, and these rites like confirmation and ordination. So this raises the question. If this latter book is banned, does it mean that it's banned for the former Ecclesia Dei communities? It seems not necessarily. Because it's talking about the, the power of the diocesan bishop here. And as the fraternity says, they have their own customs, their own norms, their own law. What makes me worried about it, though, is if you go down in the exp explanatory note, four paragraphs in, we read this on the December 18 document. And fraternity of St. Peter, this makes me worry for y'all. It reads this. After discernment, the diocesan bishop is authorized to grant permission to use only the Rituale Romanum, edition 1952, and not the Pontificale Romanum, which predate the liturgical form of the Second Vatican Council. This permission is only to be granted to canonically erected personal parishes, which according to the provisions of the Moto Proprio, Traditionis Custodis, celebrate the Missale Romanum of 1962. It should be remembered that the formula of the Sacrament of Confirmation was changed for the entire Latin Church by St. Paul VI with the Apostolic Constitution, Divine Consortium Nature, 1971. Thanks, Paul VI. Here's why I'm worried, Fraternity of St. Peter, because it's mentioning personal parishes, and that applies to you, Fraternity of St. Peter. And also, in the context of personal parishes, it says, good news, Fraternity of St. Peter, you get to use the Rituale. You can continue to use the traditional rite for baptism, extreme unction, confession, blessings, and that's all great. Standing ovation, so relieved. But it still says the Pontificale is banned in these cases. And this applies, it's in the context of personal parishes. It's the second sentence after the banning of the Pontificale. That's a problem. So hopefully the fraternity has a deal or something worked out where they're going to continue to be able to confer holy orders. And that includes the minor orders, by the way, porter, exorcist, lector, acolyte, subdeacon, and on in the deacon, priest, that they're able to continue to have holy orders in the traditional way and confirmation in the traditional way. And even for cardinals like Cardinal Burke to be able to properly celebrate the traditional Latin Mass and pontificate, to have a pontifical high Mass. Hopefully, all of that has been somehow secured, but we haven't we lay people down here on the ground. We haven't seen it or heard about it. I'm not saying it's not there, and I sure hope it is. But that scares me. And this does apply to personal parishes. Now, if we go back to Traditionos Custodis from... Where where'd you go? Here it is. From earlier this year, we have... Article 6, which says, Institutes of Consecrated Life and Societies of Apostolic Life erected by the Pontifical Commission Ecclesia Dei, that's Fraternity of St. Peter, by the way, fall under the competence of the Congregation for Institutes of Consecrated Life and Societies for Apostolic Life. Article 7. Now, this is where the rubber meets the road for the CD, 
CDW, and the December 18th document. Article 7. The Congregation for Divine Worship and the Dis Discipline of the Sacraments and the Congregation for Institutes of Consecrated Life and Societies of Apostolic Life, for matters of their particular competence, exercise the authority of the Holy See with respect to the observance of these provisions. End quote. In other words, Article 7 of Traditionus Custodis states that the Congregation for Divine Worship can and does have authority over the fraternity of St. Peter. So any clarifications regarding the 1962 Missal or the Rituale or the Pontificale, any of these things, the Congregation for Divine Worship does have authority over the fraternity of St. Peter, beginning with Traditionis. And then... Article 8, which is the last article in Traditionis, says, Previous norms, instructions, permissions, and customs that do not conform to the provisions of the present motu proprio are abrogated. That's scary as well. Because my concern is, is that modernist heretics and semi-modernists in the Vatican will use that line to say, well, I know in 1988 we promised you this bag of goodies, but we have to take some out. Well, no, no, no. We were founded in 1988 with this charism and all these things. John Paul II gave it to us. Benedict XVI confirmed it for us. I mean, we this is our deal. Yeah, I know, but Francis in Article 8 of Traditionis says, previous norms, instructions, permissions and customs that's four things norms instructions permissions and customs that do not conform to the motu proprio are abrogated these modernists love to abrogate anything traditional and they are going to camp out on article eight that's my worry as a layman who benefits from the fraternity of saint peter my deep concern is that they'll use Article 8 for the Congregation for the uh, Divine Worship to continue to whittle away at the permissions and customs and norms of the Fraternity of St. Peter. So the Fraternity of St. Peter said, well, it's our understanding that we don't have to concelebrate the Novus Ordo. Well, you may have thought that and understood that, but... Article 8 in Traditionis says all those permissions have been abrogated, so sorry. A lawnmower just fired up outside my window. Let me try to close some of this just a minute. I have no idea why a lawnmower is outside my house on Monday. So that right there could be a major problem moving forward because that last article in Traditionis, well, the, the penultimate and the ultimate article, give power to the Congregation of Divine Worship and then state that the previous permissions can be abrogated, are abrogated. And that puts the fraternity in a tough little place. Now, regarding confirmation, I saw something that was kind of funny, kind of interesting. Let me see if I have it here. Someone found this on Twitter, and I want to give them credit. Yeah, there, here it is. <laughs> this is from Matthew Hazel. Good job. He said, the Congregation of Divine Worship says that the Pontificale Romanum of the Usus Antiquior cannot be used to celebrate the Sacrament of Confirmation anymore. Well, good job. I found this in an appendix at the back of the 1962 Missale Romanum then, and it is the Rite of Confirmation. So it's in there, it's tucked in there, you know? And maybe trads are gonna have to start being careful and crafty in trying to present, and not present, to retain their rights. And by rights, I mean R-I-T-E-S and R-I-G-H-T-S, rights. Now I think it's a leaf blower outside my window. I'm just a dad with a webcam. I don't have a fancy studio. I apologize. 
Another problem with taking away the rituale is that diocesan priests can no longer, as I understand it, do baptism in the traditional rite. Uh, they can't give confession in the traditional rite, and they can't do exorcism in the traditional rite. And I fear that the diocesan Latin mass movement is going to decline, hopefully not die out, but it's going to decline. How can you keep a traditional community going when the other sacraments are all Novus Ordo and Holy Week is Novus Ordo? And then occasionally you have a Latin mass. It just doesn't, it doesn't, it's not the fullness. Now, and also when it comes to exorcisms, all priests will tell you the old one's better. And it's now taken away by this instruction? That's not good either. One interesting thing that I've learned about Italians in Italy is that Italians have lots and lots of laws. It's kind of part of the, the Roman heritage. They have so many laws that they can't really enforce the laws. And so there's a lot of laxity with regard to the law. And I kind of wonder if that's going to happen with regard to this situation. They're making so many laws against the traditional Latin mass. How are they actually going to enforce this? I mean, if a bishop in the Midwest, United States of America, uh, allows his diocesan priest to continue to have all the sacraments traditional if they want, what is Rome really going to do? And if a priest does a baptism in the old Roman rite using the rituale, is his bishop going to suspend him for that? Like, honestly, are we going to suspend hundreds and thousands of priests? Is that leaf blower loud? It's loud for me. I might have to hang up this podcast. I can't even hear myself think. You know what I think happened? I think Mrs. Marshall Joy has had some leaf guys come and doesn't know that I'm recording a video. I think that's what happened. <laughs> oh, well. Now, the other conclusion or the other outcome of all this is the Society of St. Pius X. What are you going to do if you live in a certain town or a city and your diocesan Latin mass gets shut down? It's gone. And there is no fraternity of St. Peter and there is a society of St. Pius X. People are going to go to it. And this goes back to the corral theory. The corral theory is the modernists are going to continue to push on the traditionalists and push them and push them and push them and push them out away and into a corral and when we're all in there they're going to close the gate and they're going to say y'all are in schism y'all are schismatic we tried to be nice to you we tried to throw you traditional uh pieces of candy we held carrots out in front of you and you just didn't cooperate so it's your fault you guys are out you're in schism and we're just going to treat you like uh eastern orthodox from now on we'll invite you to some ecumenical gatherings i really think that is their end game that is their end game hopefully my belief is is somehow that's all going to backfire and our lord jesus christ is going to do something miraculous to restore the roman right that's my hope and my prayer who knows another thing that's going to happen and, our, and this depends on what happens with institute of christ the king and the fraternity of saint peter is what are young men going to do who want to be priests Are they going to spend the next seven years, eight years, nine years discerning and going through seminary with the fraternity of St. Peter to suddenly not be able to be traditional priests? Are we going to see all these young men going to the Society of St. Pius X? Are we going to see something else, a third thing happen? I hope not. I don't think we need more new. Let's stop retrying to you know, reinvent this stuff. And let's get united. I don't know. 
Well, the leaf blowers are so loud, I'm going to hang it up. I don't have that much more to say anyway. I think I will say at the end here, though, we have to be united. And none of us have all the full answers. There's people that go from set of a contest to all kinds of things. I don't think anyone fully knows how we got into a situation in which all seven sacraments were changed. Um, morality and doctrine were made lax and loose and confusing. And we have such declines in demographics in the Catholic Church. And how do we get out of it? That's why I said yesterday, you got to pray your rosary every single day. Because Our Lady asked us to do it a hundred years ago. And it is the answer some way. That's our job as the laity, is we pray the rosary. We do penance, penance, penance. All right, we're going to close with the Hail Mary. We'll pray for the Fraternity of St. Peter and the Institute of Christ the King and all the former Ecclesia Dei bodies. Oremus nomini Patris et Fidi et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Ave Maria, gratia plena Dominus tecum. Benedicta tu in mulieribus et benedictus fructus ventris tui, Jesus. Sancta Maria, Mater Dei, or pro nobis peccatoribus, nunc et ator mortis nostrae. Amen. Nomini Patris et Fidi et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. All right, friends. Thanks for watching. Make sure you get to confession before Christmas and you're ready to go. Again, I'm sorry for the audio problems at the beginning and then now the leaf blowers. I don't know. I don't know. Remember, our Lord Jesus Christ is the light of the world and the salt of the earth. So go out there and be salty. God bless and Godspeed.